Good afternoon, everyone. I will call this regularly scheduled meeting of the Ways and Means Committee to order. I am Chair uh, Warsami of the committee, and I have with me uh, Council Members Cunningham, Johnson, Fletcher, Palmasano, and Vice President Jenkins. And we have a, a, a quorum that can we can conduct our business. We have tw uh, 22 items for the committee's consideration on the consent agenda, and I will read them out. Um, Item number one is a grant from the Minnesota Department of Human Services for clinic uh, clinician training. Item number two is a 2018 property tax special assessment of delinquent utility charges. Item number three is a contract amendment with Ungroup Book uh, Systems Inc. for upgrades to the Minneapolis Convention Center's online ordering portal. Item number four is a bid for the Minneapolis Convention Center's Terrazzo update wall. Item number five is a contract amendment with Life Tech Services for Emergency Medical Services at the Minneapolis Convention Center. Item number six is a request for proposal to establish the city's legal services panel. Item number seven is a grant from the United States Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance for body-worn cameras. Item number eight is a 2018 um, Justice Assistance Grant from the United States Department of Justice for Police and City Attorney Support. Item number nine is a gift acceptance for Community Planning and Economic Development Director, travel expenses to uh, the Big City Planning Directors Institute. Item number 10 is a contract with Hennepin County Medical Center, as well as the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and the University of Minnesota for the city's Information Technology Department to provide computer-aided dispatch and related mobile equipment support services. Item number 11 is a contract amendment with CSC Cybertech Corporation for the risk management information and claims processing system. Item number 12 is a contract amendment with Evolve uh, Software Corporation for upgrading Project Docs version 8.3 to version 8.6.5. Um, item number 13 is a contract with Clearwater Analyt Analytics LLC for investment, capital, and debt management services. Item number 14 is a donation of information technology equipment to nonprofit organizations. Item number 15 is a request for proposal for community solar gardens. And item number 16 is a community solar gardens agreements. Item number 17 is applications for the environmental grant funding in the fall of 2018 Brownfield Grant Round. Item number 18 is application for grant funding for the 2018 Metropolitan Council Livable Communities Demonstration Account. Item number 19 is a temporary easement agreement for Cedar Avenue South Sanitary Reconstruction Project. Item number 20 is a contract amendment with Global Spe Specialty Contractors Inc for North Town Bridge Interpretive Site Project. Item number 21 is a 4th Street Southeast Street Lighting District Establishment. And item number 22 is a contract amendment with Hennepin County for road maintenance. And do I have any discussions with any of the items? And I have Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Rosami. I don't need to pull it out for discussion, but I just wanted to lift up the community solar garden work that's happening. Uh, it's really exciting to see our city kind of uh, walking the talk when we talk about 100% renewable and making some big investments on some of our um, uh, city-owned properties. So I just want to thank the city staff who are involved in making that happen and uh, excited to be generating more renewable energy. All right. Thank you very much, Council Member Fletcher. Any other questions or queries with regards to the consent item? Seeing none, I move approval of all 22 uh, consent items. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those against? Those items have been approved. And um, now we're going to move to, our, to the interesting part of our uh, agenda today, and which is item number, the discussion items, which is item number 23 and 24. We'll start with item number 23, which is the agreement with the Minneapolis Local Organize, Organizing Committee for the 2019 National uh, Collegiate Athletics Association Division I Men's Basketball, or the Final Four. And we have today Brittany Allen, as well as uh, Mr. Tom McGuinness, and we'll start with Brittany. Brittany, go ahead. Chair Rosami, council members, as uh, Chair said, I'm Brittany Allen. I'm the events coordinator in the city coordinator's office, and I work on major events. I'm here to tell you about the 2019 Men's Basketball Final Four. 
first of all, why do we host the final four? Uh, here are some main points. We, we like to generate economic activity uh, for our city. And during the final four weekend, the city will be buzzing with both re with regional, national, and even international visitors. A lot, we would like to align our investment of public and private dollars in sports venues, hospitality, and transit infrastructure um, by showcasing our world-class facilities here in Minneapolis. We create valuable media exposure, both national and international, to help sell the market and to help sell and market the destination. We also can add to a sense of community pride. And lastly, we help support our downtown um, workers in the hospitality and um, related industries. Almost 35,000 people downtown work in this industry. And so these events fill our hotels and restaurants and really um, spur that economic growth there. One of the also one of the reasons that we host the final four is we like to strengthen our partnership with the University of Minnesota and the NCAA and we have a pretty good book of business coming up in the next few years of NCAA championships as you can see in 2018 we'll host the women's volleyball championship 2020 the men's wrestling championship 2021 men's basketball regional and um, recently announced in 2022 the women's basketball final four. And with that, I'd like to introduce Tom McGinnis, Senior Associate Athletic Director at the University of Minnesota. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, as Brittany mentioned, obviously, we've got a, a large number of championships we've hosted over the past couple of years, as well as some that we'll be hosting into the future. Very excited about the recent announcement of the 2022 Women's Basketball Final Four coming to our community, um, as well as the Volleyball Championship this December. Um, Brittany mentioned a number of reasons we host them. Some more focused on the university are, um, we feel it's a very exciting opportunity to provide our loyal fans, as well as our entire community, the opportunity to see the most premier events in college athletics. Um, certainly, these uh, events have an impact on our community, which helps one of the university's goals of being an economic engine in our state. Uh, the championships also provide a unique opportunity for our students as well as our staff um, to have unique, uh, wonderful professional experiences as well as practical educational experiences that they can use through the planning and execution of these events. And finally, but most importantly, we hold out hope that maybe one of our teams gets a home court advantage in one of these championships. We are the number three volleyball team in the country right now, so we're keeping our fingers crossed that works out for us. Specifically as host for the Final Four, our institution is involved directly with the management of the three games that we played at U.S. Bank Stadium. Beyond the games, as I mentioned, hosting a premier event in college athletics provides a tremendous opportunity to provide unique, practical, and educational experiences from, for our students. Last fall, Staff from the NCAA met with faculty from across our campus to and provide them information about how they could include certain aspects of the planning and execution of this event in the curriculum of their classes. Just last week, some staff members, or actually last month, some members from the NCAA met with students in a couple of our classes and served as guest speakers. And we're actually creating a class in spring semester specifically focused on hosting major events and tourism in our community, and they'll use the Final Four as a basis for that class. We're also sharing these opportunities with the universities and colleges in the metro area. Last week, we met with the universe, uh, representatives from a number of the Division II and Division III universities, sharing with them ways their staff and their students can also be engaged with the Final Four. We feel this connection with colleges and universities here in the metro area is key as it relates to the Final Four. The model for college athletics is fairly unique when compared to many of the other major events we've hosted in our community recently. The revenue generated from the Final Four not only supports the 68 teams that will be selected to the March Madness bracket, but also generates the majority of the revenue to support the other 89 championships that the NCAA hosts. Over half a million student athletes compete in college athletics in the Division I, II, II and III level at over 1,100 colleges and universities. Over 50,000 of them earn the opportunity to compete in these 90 championships. The success of the Final Four not only creates the opportunity for the four teams to travel to Minneapolis this April, but has also allowed the NCAA to support the University of Minnesota's women's hockey team when they won back-to-back -back national championships in 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, but also the Division III national championship football team in 2016 was St. Thomas University, and the Concordia St. Paul women's volleyball team has won an unprecedented nine Division II women's volleyball national championships. So. 
The University of Minnesota takes great pride in the opportunity to host these tremendous events and other championships and is very appreciative of the great support that we receive from the Minneapolis and those throughout our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGinnis. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Tom. Here are some uh, basic information about the, the 2019 Final Four. It will be from April 5th to the 8th, but we expect most of our guests will arrive as early as Wednesday, April 3rd, and depart Tuesday, April 9th, after the championship game on Monday night. We expect approximately 90,000 visitors, and those visitors will include um, basketball fans, college fans, and their, their pride will be very apparent as they walk through the streets of Minneapolis. Uh, we expect all 9,000 hotel rooms in Minneapolis to be full, and they'll all have a four-night minimum stay. This is a walking and transit Final Four. With all of the events conveniently located downtown, we expect visitors and re residents to fully utilize our world-class transit system, as well as walk through our beautiful downtown. Here are some numbers for you related to the Final Four. We expect $142 million in estimated economic impact for the Twin Cities region. About 23 million people will view the championship game on that Monday evening. Leading up to the Final Four, 97 million people will watch the tournament, will watch the road to Minneapolis, and the games will be broadcasted in 180 countries. As we mentioned, the University of Minnesota is a great partner of ours in this event, as is a few other organizations. The MSFA, of course, the owner of US Bank Stadium is heavily involved. The Minneapolis Local Organizing Committee is a group of locals um, set up to help coordinate all the stakeholders, as well as make sure there's a lasting impact within our community. Meet Minneapolis, of course, was a big uh, player. They brought the, helped bring the event here, and they will also make sure it goes off without a hitch. And lastly, of course, the city of Minneapolis. We will play our standard role of providing public safety, permitting, licensing, and other um, activities that we do to support events. Just to give you an idea of some of those community initiatives that I mentioned, um, education is one of the keys, and Read to the Final Four is one of their signature programs. Read to the Final Four is a year-long reading initiative for Minnesota third graders. Nine Minneapolis schools are participating and over 600 students. Free, the, this program provides free access to thousands of high-quality digital books. And as you can see, um, both mayors in Minneapolis and St. Paul are really excited about the program as well. One of their other initiatives is called Fan Jam, and the, the Fan Jam truck has been out in pretty much every community event all summer, um, not only uh, promoting kids to get up and shoot some hoops and read some, some books, but um, to have a great time while doing it. And they've been out at Open Streets events, the World Cup Festival, Armitage Festival, Pride Festival, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition to the Fan Jam truck, in partnership with the NCAA, the basketball courts at North Commons Park will also be renovated. So we'll get some brand new basketball courts at one of the community parks. Here's a quick overview of the events related to the Final Four. We have Final Four Friday at US Bank Stadium. It's a free event. All four teams will practice and there'll be a college all-star game. So that'll really be our community day uh, in the stadium. People will be able to see the football stadium transformed into a basketball arena. FanFest will be at the Minneapolis Convention Center. It's a low-cost, family-friendly event with activities, autographs. We'll also hold the NABC conference. Final Four Dribble is a kids basketball parade, and um, it's a free event for kids to attend, and they'll be given a basketball and a t-shirt and free admittance into the FanFest. March Madness Music Series will feature three days of concerts in the Armory. Um, these will be A-list talent at a low-cost ticket. There will also be a free event on Nicollet Mall from 8th to 12th Street. Tentatively, we're still working out lots of plans for that, but that will be a fun, um, exciting event to be a part of as well. And then lastly, but not least, the games. Two semifinal games on April 6th, and the championship game will be the evening of April 8th at US Bank Stadium. 
Here are the uh, financial pieces of this. Uh, the final four is an event that needs additional time and resources over and above what's normally included in department budgets. Departments prepared estimates of additional expenses that are in excess of those regular budgets for the specifically for the identified final four events that I mentioned. The costs are largely for staff overtime, use of the Minneapolis Convention Center, right away use fees and meter hooding fees. These other enterprise functions include support from the fire department, health department, traffic control, fire inspections, MACC and EOC and JIC operations. And so those funding sources are um, 1.5 million will come from the Minneapolis Local Organizing Committee. $100,000 will come from the uh, budget allocation in 2018. And $800,000 will come from the estimated entertainment tax revenue directly from tickets to the final four games. And here are the elements of the contract with the local organizing committee. It addresses funding and services and support for those final four events, as I mentioned. Um, and there will be other events outside those official events, but not nearly as many as we saw for Super Bowl, and they will pay all of their expenses directly. They wouldn't be a part of this contract. There's a provision in the contract for change orders in case things significantly change. 90% of the um, funds paid from the local organizing committee will be received prior to the event even going off. The MLOC and other parties, as like the NCA and any of the other vendors, will need to pay permits and fees as they normally would, depending on what activities um, will take place. And with that, is there any questions? Thank you, Brittany, uh, for the presentation. I have Council Member Cunningham. Thank you so much. I just wanted to um, get some clarification. So can you go back a slide for the funding? Yes. So for the 2018 um, budget allocation, is that general fund um, to the downtown asset special revenue fund? I'm just curious where that, that's coming from. Council Member Cunningham, Mark Ruff can answer that question. Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Cunningham, um, so that amount was allocated uh, by the previous mayor, and it, it is funds not from the general fund. It, are, it is funds that are allocated from the downtown assets fund. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so in the funding sources, uh, it looks like we've been a little bit conservative in calculating that because we're not calculating uh, things like permitting revenue, parking revenue, other things that we expect to come in. Uh, so we've left ourselves a little bit of room if there were overages or if there were uh, uh, surprises that were, were playing this pretty conservatively, which I just wanted to mention that I appreciate, make sure I'm understanding that correctly, but I think that that's the right approach uh, as we go into this event. Chair Warsami, Council Member Fletcher, that's correct. Um, there are potential for definitely increases in parking revenue, definitely over the weekends for sure. Um, permitting revenue, um, other lane use fee revenues, and um, regular sales taxes, the food and beverage and lodging tax as well. Thank you. Any other questions, queries? Okay, I see none. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, I will make, I'll move approval. Uh, for this item. Oh, oh, sorry, Council Member Johnson has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it's not really a question. Okay. It was just a comment on, on the motion to approve. So okay. I just want to thank staff for all their work on this, especially getting the uh, fundraising numbers as high as you have. I know that was a lot of effort and a lot of work to do that. I'm really excited that the event's going to be in Minneapolis. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm guessing this is going to pass. I personally am going to vote no. Uh, and the reason why is around the $800,000 um, coming from the Downtown Assets Fund. Uh, we have a lot of other events at ticketed venues, sites all across the city that generate entertainment tax revenue, and we do not take that funding and then subsidize those events. That's my understanding of it, and that the Downtown Asset Fund is really there to support our downtown assets from the Target Center to the Convention Center to PV uh, Plaza. And so for me personally, I just can't support uh, the subsidy for this event if we're not able to give similar subsidies for all of the other events, including our small independent uh, locally owned uh, venues that are out there. So 
Uh, I certainly understand, though, how others would come to a different conclusion than myself. Like I said, I expect it to pass. And overall, really excited about the event uh, and so glad to have it here and know that our staff, even regardless of this $800,000, uh, has stepped up to support this event in a lot of different ways and provided a lot of staff time. And so I know that uh, it is a priority uh, for the city to attract these type of events. Uh, thank you. Um, Council Vice President Jenkins first. Can, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Wasami. Can we take a look at the budget again? I want to just be clear. Is the downtown it's not allocation 100000 or 800000 so, Councilmember uh, Jenkins and Chair Warsami, the 2018 budget allocation was $100,000, and that was from the Downtown Assets Fund. The entertainment tax revenue is projected number from the event, so that would be afterwards. But uh, Mark Ruff can clarify. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Vice President Jenkins. It's important to note a couple of things. One is, um, Brittany mentioned we have an additional $1.2 million as a conservative estimate on additional local sales taxes that was um, projected to be anticipated to be received from this event. Those dollars are not allocated towards any direct uh, payments for any services, so it falls into the category of what Councilmember Fletcher mentioned as um, additional revenues. On top of it, if you recall, um, the entertainment tax was not received by the Super Bowl. Um, as a state law, um, there was not just no entertainment taxes on the tickets, but also no sales taxes um, at a state or local level. And so when we talk about comparison of events, certainly we consider the Final Four, while not as large as an impact of the, as the Super Bowl, it is certainly larger than any other event we have had in Minneapolis. Um, and so I, I would put both the Super Bowl and the Final Four into areas of exceptions. Um, and I think it's important to underline what Mr. McGinnis highlighted, which is when we have things like the NCAA volleyball tournament coming to town as it is in December, they pay all of the costs. You know, they don't ask for a subsidy. And so we see the benefit of the Final Four as really a long-term relationship with the NCAA where we can draw people into Minneapolis, um, that we can provide some of these dollars for not just our larger schools, but our smaller schools that exist around the metropolitan area. So I think we fully, fully appreciate this and fully appreciate Councilmember Johnson's comments. We just want you to know that this is not a habit that we anticipate getting into. We see it as, a, as an event that um, a number of years ago we submitted a bid with our partners. And these were the budgets um, that were laid out. Certainly, Kate Mortensen is here from the local organizing committee, you, we were we have raised, or they have raised, um, probably close to twice as much as what was originally anticipated for the budget for this event. So I think it's, you know, context, I'm just trying to contextualize some of those um, comments because we do take the economics of these and the equity of them very seriously, but feel like this is something rather extraordinary that we should both celebrate, but also um, place into a separate category from other events that may occur in the future, if that helps. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilman Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I just want to confirm, because uh, I, I understand the point that uh, Councilmember Johnson was making, but I also, my understanding is that this is not the complete budget of the final four, that this is the portion that the city is being asked to participate in for things that are specific to the city, but that uh, the overall project is not particularly neglectful of downtown assets, that there are, is rental happening at the convention center, that there is other uh, other resources and other line items within the broader Final Four uh, that is going into those downtown assets and that is generating a lot of activity there. So, uh, you know, for me, I think I feel pretty comfortable with uh, the very specific sort of one-for-one -one, uh, tax revenue from those tickets uh, uh, going into this event as uh, the closest thing that the city does uh, to uh, to really subsidizing this in any uh, you know meaningful way. Uh, but I do just want to lift up that there are investments being made in uh, uh, through the stadium authority that will expand our future capacity to do indoor events like the volleyball tournament and other things, uh, that there are investments being made in the convention center. Um, 
uh, that aren't accounted for on this budget. But the, the, the overall budget is more like $10 million, if I remember right. So I just wanted to make sure that we understand the full picture as we think about what we're committing to here. Correct. These are the, uh, Chair Rosami, Council Member, these are the direct hard costs that are not already included in budget. So correct. That's, that's not the whole universe here. All right, thank you very much. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll move this item for approval. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? No. Uh, the item has passed. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation, Brittany and Mr. McGuinness. And now we have the final item, which is item number 24. And um, item number 24 is the Navigation Center Development at 2105, 2109, 2113 Cedar Avenue and 1820 22nd Street East. Um, the passage of resolution approving various appropriation not to exceed 1,500,000 for the development of a navigation center at 2109 Cedar Avenue South. And that's number one. And two is authorizing other actions necessary to advance the navigation center to be located at 2109 Avenue South. Um, and I also have a number of resolutions, walk-in items. Resolution number one, and it should be in front of every uh, committee member, uh, should have one, a copy of each. And the first one is a resolution by myself declaring that the Navigation Center project is a neighborhood revitalization uh, purpose for which consolidated redevelopment TIF district funds may be expanded. Uh, expended, I mean, and the second resolution again is by myself declaring the official intent of the city of Minneapolis to reimburse certain expenditures from the proceeds of tax exempt bonds to be issued by the city. And I have uh, to do the presentation um, our budget director, uh, uh, Mr. Micah Intermill. Micah? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will speak to the um, underlying amendment, or uh, excuse me, underlying uh, resolution included um, on the printed agenda, um, as well as the uh, first walk-on uh, resolution that you had mentioned regarding the neighborhood revitalization purpose. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Frank and Mr. Lutz uh, are here from uh, CPED to mm -hmm. speak to the third resolution or the second walk-on, um, as well as a memorandum of understanding which constitutes the, um, the other actions necessary listed under number two of the agenda item. Mm -hmm. So the, the first, uh, first uh, resolution amends the 2018 budget uh, authorizing CPED to spend up to uh, one and a half million dollars for development of the navigation center um, to the extent that uh, costs of development are eligible for uh, uh, TIF dollar expenditure, they will be, so TIF dollars will be expended first to the extent that costs are not eligible uh, for TIF dollar use, um, then those uh, costs would be paid for uh, by dollars that had uh, originally been general fund dollars, which were transferred to the pension funds um, to provide some uh, a bit of a cash cushion several years ago. There's uh, no longer a need for that uh, cash cushion, so we're recalling those general fund dollars to be used uh, again for this purpose. Um, the the your resolution itself also requires uh, finance and property services staff to report back to this committee on how much was spent uh, both in total and also from each source so that there's clarity uh, by year end as to what actually happened in order to uh, develop the navigation center. Um, are there any questions on that resolution? No questions? Great. Okay. Mr. Frank. Mr. Chair, committee members, David Frank from CPED. Thank you, Micah. Appreciate it. Um, I thought I'd round out the story somewhat as we have visited with each other over the past few weeks. You've been eager for more information. We're here today with a lot more information. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd give you just sort of the quick recap of what we're going to ask you for tell you some of the story of what we've been doing and some of the additional information we have for you today 
and then go in detail into the reasons for the requests that we're making, and then of course answer your questions. So as, uh, as Micah laid out, we're here asking for four things this afternoon, the appropriation of funds that Micah just described and the related consolidated tax increment resolution allowing the use of that source, those are two, the bond reimbursement resolution, more on that in a few minutes, and then our negotiated memorandum of understanding with Red Lake for the use of their property. Okay, so that's the high level of what we're asking for. So just a quick recap, um, I know we all remember, but it's worth saying again, um, this site at 2109 Cedar, it's about an acre and a quarter. Um, this, the property is bisected by another private property ownership, the Cedar Box Company and it includes this acre and a quarter, the Red Lake Nation parcels and some city-owned parcels and some 2B city-owned parcels I'll describe in a few minutes. Um, it's zoned OR3, so residential is permitted, and the site is not remediated. So we're gonna spend time today, I know, and we've spent time at previous committee meetings speaking about the environmental condition. Um, so we'll come back to that as well. It is close geographically to the current encampment which we understand to be important. It is immediately adjacent to the uh, Franklin Avenue station on the blue line. Um, we have formed a terrific working partnership with the Red Lake Nation and their development team, many of whom are here today. The site is not immediately adjacent to a residential neighborhood and um, the housing won't be available, the navigation center won't be available until the beginning of December. Okay, and then as a reminder, the affordable housing project that Red Lake is pursuing needs the site back at the end of May. So December through May is six months that the navigation center will operate in this location. Here's an update. Um, as city coordinator uh, briefed the enterprise committee and much more at the housing policy and development committee next week, we believe we have an operator for the navigation center the team is meeting this week to work out the details, and we expect that we'll have lots more information for, for, the, for that committee, for HPD, next week. So let me spend, any questions on the overall? I know you know this, just wanted to make sure we've all heard it recently. Great. Um, so to the appropriation of funds that Micah just mentioned, um, it's worth noting that should you choose to uh, give this appropriation, that we will then use standard city rules to enter into the contracts to accomplish this work with the exception of the procurement ex rules exemption that you gave us last time. Also, and here's a noticeable update, we found out just days ago that the trailer provider we've been working with will not allow us to use their trailers for residential purposes, which this will be. We had been working on the basis that this provider understood and did understand that these uh, classroom trailers would be used for residential purposes, that people would be sleeping in them. And we now understand very clearly that they will not allow that use for a trailer rental. So we have several other, uh, several other options that we are looking into quickly, and I'll just name those and then I expect that there'll be some questions. So there are other trailer providers, and we are exploring that. We have heard interest from community members and some of you about what are called sprung structures. That's the name of a company. And it, you know, picture a tennis bubble. Um, we are looking into that. And also a manufacturer called Man Camp, which is um, available for um, workers in North Dakota having, it's done being used for workers in North Dakota and is similar in some ways to trailers which are connected to each other. So there's a series of things we're looking into, but the trailer provider we have been working with, and remember trailers are a little scarce these days because of um, tragedies in other parts of the United States, um, has said that we can't use those trailers, their trailers, for residential purposes. Questions on that before I keep going? Any okay. questions? Okay. No, keep going. Thank you. Um, Micah mentioned the consolidated tax increment resolution, which allows us to use that funding source for, uh, for most of the cost, at least most of the cost of what we're proposing to do here. Let me spend a minute on the bond reimbursement resolution. So this is another of our walk-on items. So 
it, should you say yes to this, and we recommend that you do, this protects the eligibility of any city paid expenses for the permanent housing project, and we don't think there will be any, but just in case there are, which are spent in advance of closing on that project can be reimbursed from future bond proceeds, okay? So if we have a circumstance that we don't foresee where, uh, where we've spent some money that's eligible to be reimbursed by those bond proceeds, this resolution says that's okay. So again, we don't think this comes into play, but we're just being as careful as we can and asking you to say yes to that and pass that resolution. So let me talk for a few minutes about the negotiated, through the great work of Chuck Lutz, the memorandum of understanding with Red Lake. So you have it in front of you, it's posted online, just the high level uh, structure of it. So we've negotiated this MOU with an entity called RLBC Franklin Station, LLC. It outlines the responsibilities of the parties in building out the navigation center, as well as other actions the city would take to support the ultimate housing development, the one that starts in June, at the end of May. The MOU leads to the, the site that you have selected for the navigation center being available for it. There are three phases. The total city costs are, is the 1.5 we expect that you're, we're asking you to appropriate today. Phase one for initial site prep, moving out the tenant, removing asbestos, demolishing the structures, grading and blacktopping the site. Demolition would begin right away. Some demolition activities are already underway. And the city's costs in this first phase would be some $435,000. Okay, this work would be done by Red Lake's general contractor for the housing project. Phase two is the architecture and engineering costs related to the layout of the structures, hooking up the structures to utilities, the procurement of the structures, and we would contract for this work directly. And I should mention here that the architecture and engineering firm who we're using is called Full Circle Indigenous Planning. This is a native-owned firm contracted, procured through our target market program, and we're pretty proud of that and happy about that. Um, and we're also working with emergency management, city emergency management, to secure cots and bedding and room dividers. And the cost of that work in phase two is some $800,000. Phase three is removing the structures, removing the blacktop, and preparing to hand the site back for the housing development. Also in the MOU, just a few more things. The, once there's an operator, and again, we think we have an operator and much more at HPD committee next week, the city would sublease to the operator to provide the property management and the services on the site. Now here's the, uh, the additional city property I mentioned. In conjunction with our own preliminary development review process for the housing project, we will recommend that the city vacate the alley on the block as well as the turn back from the state of Minnesota, DOT, MnDOT, uh, which is at the south, and that we, those properties would be available to Red Lake, adjacent to their property and adjacent to the housing project. So this is described in the MOU, as is the last thing I'll mention, that the MOU describes rent for the site in the amount equal to the first half of 2019 property taxes. So about $28,000 is rent from us, from the city, to Red Lake. So those are the very high level terms from the MOU. And Mr. Chair, that's the end of the four things we're recommending for you to consider today. And we're available for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Frank. Um, any questions from my colleagues? Okay. I just wanted to ask a question um, then. I'll give it to Councilmember Johnson. Um, in terms of the, the trailer company not yes. allowing for housing, how, how will that affect the budget? Or? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, great question. So we believe that within the budget that the appropriation that we're suggesting uh, that you, the money we suggest you appropriate today, that we can make the other options work within the same amount of money. And if not, we would come back to you and ask for some, for some additional funds. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question if it's now's the time to ask about the resolution here. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe this is a question for Mr. Ruff uh, or for Mr. Intermill. But uh, 
This resolution uh, declaring the Navigation Center project as a neighborhood revitalization purpose, uh, pulling from the Consolidated Revi Redevelopment TIF district funds. Um, could you let us know if this in any way affects our neighborhood association funding uh, or if that is pulling from that same bucket? Uh, Chair Warsami, Council Member Johnson, good question. Um, the short answer is no. It is not taken away from any current uh, funding for neighborhoods. Um, and in fact, if you recall, within the last two years, there has also been a repayment of funding that had early, earlier had been a uh, uh, lesser amount in previous years due to some budget constraints that is now being repaid. So what's happened is the Consolidated TIF District, because of its location, part of uh, downtown and part of uptown, the market values have increased such that we just have more TIF revenue than was anticipated. Um, and originally in the mayor's recommended budget, that TIF revenue was being directed toward 2019 housing, affordable housing efforts. Um, we are planning on using the consolidated TIF money for um, the costs that Mr. Frank mentioned, and then we will use other TIF districts to help supplement the mayor's 2019 budget. But because it, we did review with the city attorney's office the eligible costs Mr. Inamo talked about, we may not cover 100% of the eligible cost, but we think we're confident we can cover 90% out of the consolidated. But because the consolidated has that specific terminology, um, we just want to go on record that we are, as a council, if you approve this resolution, are also agreeing that um, the support of the encampment relocation is a neighborhood revitalization expenditure. And I'm just trying to reconcile that with my memory around the consolidated TIF. I thought it was for neighborhood associations and then the other piece was around the Target Center Convention Center. And it sounds like that's, is that accurate? Is that the original intent and purpose and the two sources that are the two destinations for that funding? Um, Mr. Chair, Council Member Johnson, so the two original um, uses of the funding when funds were more constrained were the original Target Center acquisition debt, and we anticipate that that debt will all be paid for, um, and even faster than what was anticipated originally. And neighborhood re revitalization purposes, which historically had been um, primarily support of the NCR department and um, neighborhood expenditures. So it's both of those that have more recently been used, and I think there were some budget amendments that you were involved with even before my time here that moved more of NCR functions into um, the uh, tax increment budget than what originally had been. Um, again, because we have more dollars, it gives you as a council the opportunity, and the mayor in his recommended budget expanded on the use of neighborhood revitalization to include affordable housing. And so that first step was done by the mayor in his recommended budget for 2019. This would be expanding specifically, essentially defining affordable housing as encampment relocation to include homeless. So the mayor put it in his recommended budget. Essentially, that would be a new policy decision that this council has yet to ratify or take up would be to add that affordable housing as a new purpose of these funds. So we haven't taken that decision up yet, but that's what the mayor is proposing in this budget. So it's introducing a new purpose to these funds than originally um, contemplated. Sure, uh, correct. I'm looking over at Mr. Uh, Nelson to see if he has any other commentary. But I think it, if I'm if I'm not saying anything correct, but I there are two things happening um, in relatively close periods of time. Um, one is the mayor's recommended budget. The other is um, actually a tax increment modification, which will be coming in front of um, a committee in November. I believe it's the uh, uh, regulatory services uh, committee that will hold that public hearing. Um, and so that 
that was done in concert with the mayor's recommendation. So you're right, this is the first step, but there will be two other steps. Um, there will be that TIF plan modification, which is required by state law, and then there would be the budget consideration as well. And I ask these questions, and, and I notice uh, behind you, I see some uh, folks in the audience who have been very involved with NRP and uh, and these funding sources over time. And so I'm trying to understand this, since this is my first time seeing this, uh, in terms of how this might change uh, that original policy direction or intent of the use of these funds. And if um, this is something that may be considered as undermining neighborhood association funding, because if there's excess in there, was there an expectation over time for that excess to essentially be redistributed to our neighborhood associations, considering they've had cuts of about 75% over time from the original funding, is my understanding. So, Sure. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Johnson, I think um, certainly it's an important policy issue for you as a council to consider. Um, it is more than $10 million that the mayor has out of the $30 million. I'm looking at Mr. Intermill, it's probably $13 million of the mayor's proposal that's coming from the consolidated TIF district. So to replace $13 million, if you if you as a council, I just want to give you a sense of scale. It's not just about the million and a half. Overall, it's really more about the policy issue that you raised, and that's a $13 million change that would have to occur in order to still fully fund all the affordable housing recommendations that the mayor has. And certainly during budget time, you as a council can take up that issue. Okay. Well, I see some of my other colleagues have questions, so I appreciate the answers on this and All right. take some time to think about this. Thank you, Councilman Johnson, Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Rosami. And I guess my question was somewhat related to your initial question, um, but I just want to be clear, we're not sure what we're purchasing nor who is going to operate the navigation center. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Chair, Council Vice President Jenkins, um, we know that we need, in order to hit the timeline that we've told you the first week of December, we know we need to make a choice very quickly. And in order to make that choice as quickly as we'd like to, as we think we need to, we need an appropriation in hand so that we can make the right choice. So we just found this out. We're going to gather the information as quickly as we can, and we will make the best choice possible in order to accommodate the people by the beginning of December. So yes, it's true that we don't know uh, what we're going to uh, what we're going to either lease or purchase, but it's also true we will make um, the best choice possible, probably among the things I mentioned, possibly others. And yes, it is true that we do not have a final agreement with an operator yet, but I spoke to the city coordinator this morning and she said I should characterize it that we think we do and that subject is figuring things out in the next days, there will be a report at HPD next week about the operator. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilman Cunningham. Thank you, Chair Rosami. Um, just to get clarification, can you? So we are here today because we're kind of looking at this for the first time. The resolution yep. for the consolidated TIF, um, okay. the bond reimbursement resolution, the MOU with Red Lake, and what is the fourth thing? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Cunningham, the appropriation of, of funds. 1.5? Okay. Yes. Um, and can you, so just to get clarification, you're saying that if we were to exceed the 1.5 million, is that where the bond reimbursement would come in? Or can you explain that part a little bit better? Or yep. for me, please. Sure. Mr. Chair, Councilmember Cunningham, uh, so the appropriation that we're asking for today is 1.5. If we went above, if the structures cost more, if there's other unexpected things, we would need to come back to you for an additional appropriation, period, full stop. The bond reimbursement resolution says that if the city incurs costs related to the affordable housing project that Red Lake will start on in June, and again, we don't think we will, and if we did, it would not be in any way related to that 1.5 or 1.5 plus, then we would uh, we would have you would have given your blessing already that we could be reimbursed from the bond proceeds for those costs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Cunningham, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Barsami. Um, 
I want to recognize, I, I think all of the staff who have been asked to work on this and asked to present on this are doing incredibly hard work and are being asked to put something forward that is not the way we would usually do it. Uh, I think normally um, a lot of the questions that we have, uh, they would like to have more comprehensively answered uh, before they're standing at the podium here. Yes. And I, I recognize that we've put you in a, mm -hmm. uh, a tough position and that frankly, world historical circumstances have put you in a tough position. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate the work happening. So I recognize uh, that there are still some things to be figured out here. I recognize that we have some listening to continue to do. Uh, both with the community that we're serving and the community around us. And uh, I know that uh, we're committed to being engaged with that. Um, you know, we've formed a task force that can engage a little more so that we can dig into these questions. I know you're coming back to present next week. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to both signal to everybody that in general, uh, we're not going to get in the habit of approving appropriations uh, mm -hmm. at this scale uh, with this level of information <laughs> and that this is precisely what the council asked staff to bring us in this case. So I want to really appreciate um, that we're able to move forward, that uh, we're putting both a lot of responsibility and a lot of trust in you. Uh, and I thank you for taking that on. Uh, and I'm looking forward to continuing to working with you as we uh, step in to play what's just a critical role in this community right now uh, in a community where people are really hurting. So thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Fletcher. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just anticipating that we are probably going to a vote uh, just wanted to throw it out there that I'll abstain from this uh, particular item as it relates to the consolidated TIF just to do a little more digging so I can better understand it and look at the origins. It does seem to me like a significant uh, policy decision. Maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but that's what it seems like to me and just wanted to dig in a little further. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Council Member Johnson. And um, thanks to all the staff. Um, I think, is there any other questions? No, I'll just add, um, my uh, sentiments exactly how Council Member Fletcher mentioned. Uh, our staff have worked very diligently in a very short period of time, a lot of pressure, and this is an emergency, and it's uh, an issue of urgency. Uh, that's the reason why we're not following the same process. Um, so I really appreciate the work they've done and the solution and the creativity that went around finding this uh, source uh, for the Navigation, navigation Center. And um, since there's no further discussion, um, I'll make a motion to approve item number 24. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those against? And I want to mark that Council Member Johnson abstained on one of the items, right? On, on the resolution for the TIF financing. Um, thank you, everybody. Since we have finished all items on our agenda have concluded our business. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.